So today we're going to talk about how I became Orthodox. Hello everyone and God bless. This is Father Mikhail, Father Michael, uh, with a different episode of Living Orthodox Today and one that's been requested uh, a couple times. And so I'll be talking about a little touching just a little bit on my dad's background and my mom's background because it's it's quite an extensive story there but uh you know the the title of the video is how i became orthodox so that's what we we'll talk about before we get into that uh in the description will be links to my uh, living orthodox discord server and of course my my gofundme and uh, my patreon and thanks be to god there's now a couple of opportunities that have been presented to me that will allow me to work full-time as a priest um, and provide for my family. It's now just a matter of praying for these things to come to fruition and for God to give me discernment on which path I'm going to take. Um, but thanks be to God, um, my, my wonderful bishop has uh, really uh, been trying to be supportive of my me and my family and has uh, presented potentially uh, exactly what we've been waiting for for a long time. Um, that being said, it's not an easy decision and we have to be discerning and, and wise with it. So keep me in your prayers and, and my family and uh, just pray that God will give us wisdom and guidance. Um, shout out to the wonderful people though from Alberta who have been uh, messaging me and, and uh, been very warm and, and sweet. Um, you know, to John and, and his lovely wife Mary at uh, the Holy Dream Mission Church in Lethbridge. I'm looking forward to coming to visit you guys. And if any of you watching this are in Alberta or really close by to Lethbridge, um, I will be there serving Vespers and Liturgy um, on, the, on the first weekend of August. So uh, that being said, let's get into the video. <clears throat> so um, really briefly, my, my dad's side of the family uh, came to Canada from uh, what is now modern day Ukraine. Um, my dad's uh, grandfather was uh, from a line of Cossacks uh, originating out of Zaporizhia. And, uh, and his mom shared, uh, you know, his, uh, sorry, my, my great grandmother, my dad's um, grandma, she had a similar background to him. Um, and when they came to Canada, they, of course, uh, experienced a lot of the, the troubles that um, many Eastern Europeans from that part of the world uh, experienced. Uh, discrimination, prejudice, everything. However, um, it was in that time frame that my great grandfather, Mikhail, became um, a priest, an Orthodox priest. And, uh, and he, he, you know, he started out in Alberta and Sask uh, Saskatchewan, was in Manitoba for a bit. And then my family came to Ontario, where my great grandfather served uh, in Windsor at uh, three different parishes. Um, from time to time, he filled in at the uh, Romanian Orthodox Church, and he primarily served at Holy Trinity Russian Orthodox Church. And then he also spent some time and helped out a bit at St. John the Divine, uh, which is now under the OCA, but back then it was a, uh, you know, it was known as the Metropolia. So uh, some interesting, interesting facts there. So my mom on the other side, her family came from Western Europe, and, um, <clears throat> you know, she's predominantly of English and Scottish descent. There's some um, Scandinavian there as well. Actually, even on my dad's side, there's a little bit of that. And, um, you know, she was raised, of course, by, uh, by Presbyterians. She was a, you know, raised by Scottish Protestants. So um, she eventually went the route of more of, a, of an evangelical background. Um, so Anyways, my dad, um, due to some tragic events that happened in my dad's side of the family, alcoholism became a problem for my grandfather at one point. Um, uh, Vasily, his name was also Vasily. My dad's name is Vasily. And my dad's dad, um, of course, stressed out my, my great-grandfather, who was a priest and didn't approve of things like gambling and drinking. But um, my, my grandfather, unfortunately, had developed a lot of abusive tendencies that resulted in my father running away from home. It was um, over the, the many years that he had run away from home that he met my mother 
and my dad had kind of gone down a you know his own road a very agnostic atheistic way of living and my mom turned him on to uh, Protestantism and my dad became a very fervent um, evangelical for a time and, and we were involved in a charismatic evangelical church and that's what I was born into and uh, initially it was looking like my mom could not have children she had severe uh, endometriosis and uh, they told her you know forget about it it's it's you're not going to have children and they prayed a lot about it and just one day my my mom's tubes cleared you know god is merciful to everyone and um unfortunately my mom did have a miscarriage and uh the, the child that they they were going to have before me died about three months into the pregnancy um that said uh my mom knew uh she said that it, it was just something that came to her that uh, she believes god had said her that a year from then she would have a child and sure enough uh, a year and two days later i was born and um i was born on the eighth, on the 8th of may 1991 and uh in toronto uh, toronto ontario and so um my parents of course started raising me in the protestant sect that they were a part of and everything that that included and all the stereotypical evangelical protestant beliefs um so eventually they, they moved us to a town called Woodstock for my dad's uh, ministry and work. And at the last minute, they decided to pull my dad's funding and they left us stranded in Woodstock, Ontario, uh, which funny enough, my wife also came from Woodstock, Ontario. However, I did not meet her there. We actually didn't meet until we both were adults and we uh, both had moved to London, Ontario and had been living in the city for, in her case, at least a year. And for me, I'd been living here already for about five years, um, five to six years. And so... Uh, it, it's really funny because actually my wife and I just grew up down the road from each other and we saw each other at the local grocery store because she worked there and I stopped in there after work all the time and I was way too shy to approach her. Um, you know, she's this beautiful, tall young woman uh, working with seafood and you know, when I saw her cutting up those fish, I wasn't so sure I wanted to approach her. Just kidding, honey. I know you're, I know you're watching this, so I had to throw a little joke out there. Um... <clears throat> But uh, anyways, my, uh, you know, uh, my parents and I, after a few years of being in Woodstock uh, and after, um, you know, and, and I'd grown with a strong love for the Bible, uh, for, with a strong love for Jesus Christ. Um, for me, I couldn't fathom people not believing in him. And actually, I got in trouble a lot in my first private school, that I, uh, public school that I went to in, in Woodstock. And uh, I'd get in trouble for talking about Jesus to the kids and trying to convert them. <laughs> You know, and I many times got told, you can't do that. You know, not everyone believes the same things you do. And I was thinking, how, how is it that, you know, and I just, I was innocent. I was stupid. You know, unfortunately I was taught by heretics, but I did have, I did have a love. And, and just as a spoiler, both my mom and my dad did convert to Eastern Orthodoxy with, with me and my wife and, and actually my sister and now my, and my brother-in-law, um, you know, they, they converted as well. And now my brother-in-law is, uh, is an ordained deacon. So he, he was actually ordained just this past Pentecost uh, by Archbishop Gabriel. So glory to God. So anyways, um, due to uh, a lot of bullying, uh, I, I went to the school I was first at that I mentioned before it was very rough. And uh, my parents decided to put me in a private Christian school, uh, a Presbyterian Dutch reform school by the name of John Knox. And uh, it didn't get any better. I, I certainly had a hard time fitting into a, a culture and into an environment that was pretty new to me. And, you know, I had kind of already gotten into fight mode when I was at the other school and got used to having to punch my way through problems. And, you know, learning that when somebody started running their mouth, that usually meant they wanted to fight you. So I was pretty sensitive and uh, already kind of starting to, to not have a, is, is naive and trusting worldview. And, uh, you know, I, I would get in trouble a lot. I, I got discriminated against by a lot of uh, people there for not being Dutch and uh, in particular, some of the staff. And I, and I did get physically uh, beaten by some of them. I had a, funny enough, the Bible teacher there, uh, I'll never forget one kid was just talking when she was and she, I, I think she got fired shortly after I left, but she threw the Bible at him and cocked him right in the head with it and, and you know she hit us with the yardstick she you know grabbed me by the neck with her nails and dragged me down the hall and 
you know, and, and that was simply because I told her, you can't throw the Bible at him. And she said, oh, you're coming to the principal's office. And so I was constantly getting in trouble there. And uh, I was so dismayed because I thought going to a Christian school was going to be great. I thought I was going to be talking to other kids who love Jesus. And then I discovered they talked about him so little there that there was almost no difference. And that this Protestant school was in all reality, you know, just like all things Protestant, it just name drops God. They'll throw a few arbitrary Bible quotes. They'll obsessively study the scriptures outside of context and won't know a thing about applying it to their lives, which the Orthodox Church has. But that said, um, you know, uh, my parents, uh, because some of my closer friends at that school uh, invited me to the youth group. My parents eventually acquiesced because after a while, you know, we'd been, uh, we had been with the Nazarene church and then the Baptist church in, in Woodstock. And then they said, okay, we'll, we'll switch over to the Pentecostal church. And, you know, they were more embracing of that because they were evangelical charismatics. Um, unfortunately, and, and I can testify to this being demonic, my, my mother and my father, but it could both speak tongues. My, my mom could speak in tongues. It's obviously not a heavenly language. It's very demonic, as Father Seraphim Rose discusses in Orthodoxy and the Religion of the Future. But, um, and, and I'll never forget the first time my mom prayed over me in tongues. I felt unsettled and it freaked me out and asked her what the heck was that and she said oh it's okay it's 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 a holy prayer language it's uh and she said oh i've been you know my dad your dad and i've been praying for you to to receive the gift of tongues and you know we're really hoping one day you'll you'll have that too and i never did i never spoke in tongues and i'm very glad i didn't <laughs> you know very glad um you know i, I didn't want to be uh like that and, and she never knew what she was saying there, there was certainly some kind of structure and reason to it but she never knew what she was saying and my dad would rarely do it and so you know a lot of this started to sow doubt in me because i thought well you know, my parents can speak in tongues and i can't does this mean god hates me does he not like me you know i don't have spiritual gifts and yet other people seem to some people were claiming to be prophetic of course all of this is pure delusion and prillis they don't even have the holy spirit these heretics forgive me if you're pentecostal and you're watching this it's not that i don't love you uh, a lot of protestants think oh he's attacking my belief so he must hate me that's not it i do hate the beliefs because they are deceptive and they are not remotely reflective of anything and i mean of anything in scripture you know people were understanding the apostles when they spoke in tongues and the tongues of angels has often been taken to mean that whenever the apostles spoke everyone could understand them in their perspective tongue because when you really think about it whenever an angel from heaven has appeared before any saint in the orthodox church they somehow understand them because why it, it's it's beyond our limited vocabulary it's it's beyond a mundane experience and i'll leave it at that so you know finally i you know left john knox school and went to another public school things didn't get much easier uh with you know the constant bullying it started you know and i felt like you know god wasn't answering my prayers for anything and i thought you know not knowing how even prayer worked of course as a protestant i thought wow god must just not like me you know he, he just mustn't like me i must be somehow appalling to him you know, and I was trying my best to be virtuous, to, you know, follow the Ten Commandments, to, you know, hold to my chastity. And, um, you know, got to high school and, you know, I'm, I made some, some friends there. Um, still close friends with one of the guys that I went to high school with. And uh, shout out to, to Mitch if he's watching, you know, love you, man. Uh, just, you know, if you're watching, thank you. <laughs> if you're not, don't worry. Um but anyways, I, uh, you know, I started having some experiences uh, with some of our group of friends and there were some definitely demonic things that happened to my friends living out of town, um, small town in Drumbo where there was uh, a lot of witchcraft and other stuff that would occur there. And um, uh, it, it was, um, there was a couple of demonic experiences and I just found like a, my Protestantism didn't equip me to deal with it at all. Nothing worked. Um, the way that I've been taught to deal with it didn't work. And, you know, just the constant dread and, you know, my friends seeing terrifying things I saw, shadows moving in, in unnatural ways and things that I can't really explain. And, uh, and of course, you know, there was bullying, fights, girls, you know, all this stupid high school drama. 
you know, I, you know, I, I ended up having a girlfriend and, um, you know, I gave way too much of my heart to her. Uh, you know, we were both really stupid and, uh, long or the short of it is she, she wasn't loyal to me. And so I, I became very disheartened and I, I broke up with her and, uh, that kind of started a very strange nihilistic depressive state in my life, which it really shouldn't have. But I thought, wow, God didn't answer my prayers on this. He, you know, I, I even at one point had threatened to break up with her unless she, you know, was going to follow me on, on wanting to be a Christian. And so she, she said she wanted to, but it was, you know, we were kids, but what did we know? <laughs> and uh, then, you know, she got involved with someone else and I found out about it later. And so I was, I was very disheartened and, and I thought, you know, God doesn't love me, doesn't like me, doesn't listen to my prayers. Um, so I started becoming very distant from God. I didn't want to go to church anymore. I didn't even want to read the Bible anymore. I did you know, it, it kind of gotten beaten into me when I was at John Knox where, you know, and, you know, we were reading the Protestant Bible um, once a year for school, but it, it became a chore and it wasn't a joy anymore. And so um, I was very disgruntled. I, you know, I felt like, what's the purpose? What, what is my purpose? I don't, I don't know what I'm even meant to do. Like, why won't God answer me? <laughs> you know, and that's, that was my thinking, which was stupid. And, you know, I started getting involved in martial arts. And uh, it, when I was first in Woodstock at, at a Kempo school, which, uh, you know, any martial artist watching this, yes, I know Kempo is useless. <laughs> um, uh, but, you know, I, I started getting into, unfortunately, some of the Eastern mysticism, such as, you know, the, the Q show and the, the pressure point stuff, the energy stuff. And I ended up studying Kung Fu out in London um, with one of my friends and uh, the wonderful teacher there, his name is also Michael. Um, he, he was actually an Anglican um, minister at one point, a traditional Anglican. And he actually was trying to discourage me because he had at one point studied Buddhism. And he said, don't go down that road. Don't go down Buddhism. It's, it's not good. Uh, you know, you should look into contemplative prayer, you know, Christian prayer, Christian meditation. And then he started mentioning the Jesus prayer that the Eastern Orthodox do. And he's not Eastern Orthodox. Um, I, I pray one day he will be, <laughs> but uh, I, I don't know um, if he ever will. But um, I just kind of let it fly over my head for a while. I, I ended up in a couple of other bad uh, relationships that didn't pan out. And, um, you know, I had moved to London at this point gone to college and uh you know i started attending another martial arts school while going to the other one where uh, it was actually run by a mormon and he was teaching mikyo buddhism and kundalini as part of his martial arts stuff and i started getting into like that more dark side mysticism stuff and yeah it, it got it got freaky and uh to the point where i i felt unwell and so I decided to stop and uh, when I was in college I uh, I experienced a, a lot of depression um, you know a lot of difficult things from my past started coming up um, I was diagnosed actually at that time um, misdiagnosed I would even argue maybe even you know with PTSD and they want to put me on antidepressants and uh, I just felt like my life was spiraling I felt like uh, everything was out of control and that you know god had just totally abandoned me i was trying to mix christianity with these weird meditative practices i even started doing tibetan buddhism meditations with, with a tibetan buddhist nun who would come to the school and was using the same space that the uh, uh, that the protestant christian group met on campus with and um you know i met a, a girl in college who i would say that was probably the first time i really developed um very um, strong feelings for someone. And uh, I won't go into details, but uh, the kind of person she presented herself to be was not who she actually was. And it just totally destroyed my ability to trust anyone. And so I I just kept spiraling. And then, you know, I uh, had an experience where um, someone I knew had uh, an abortion. And I was deeply unsettled by this. I said, don't do this. Don't go through with it. I actually even went to the hospital with her to try to stop her. And, you know, I even said to the people in, in the uh, abortion clinic there, I said, how the hell can you do this? 
you know, I'd, I'd looked it up and it's, you know, seeing how the fetuses would try to avoid the instruments pertaining to that procedure. And I thought, how can you kill your own child? And so I started thinking to myself, how can this worldly Buddhist, um, forgive me, <laughs> you know, Starbucks, white girl religion, uh, Western spiritual atheistic uh, nonsense have any fulfillment in it when life itself can be just defined based on convenience for people. And so I, I thought, no, I, I need to look deeper. And so I, um, you know, I went monk mode. I, at this point I was um, working for a call center in London doing telephone surveys <laughs> and uh, met some wonderful people in that office. Um, it was, it was not an easy job. It was very repetitive. Um, daily, I would have somebody inevitably tell me to go kill myself. And I was, at that time, I was really struggling with that. I was on um, an SSRI, a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor. Uh, and then, you know, I switched to antidepressants and I was going to a Catholic church. And, um, you know, I, I, I decided, you know what, I love their anti-abortion stance. I started falling in love with the Bible again, with the saints, with the mother of God. Um, you know, I was given a rosary on my first actual visit there for mass. They had a, a thing going on. I had a good conversation with the priest in which he started explaining to me what apostolic succession was, how the church never disappeared. Little did I know that he was actually talking about the Orthodox church and I shouldn't have listened to uh, the, the papal nonsense, but you know, my Protestant brain thought, oh, well, this is pre-Luther and uh, this is pre-Protestantism, so this must be it. And I just kind of jumped on board. And, you know, I really got into studying, um, you know, Catholic, uh, Catholicism. I was given, a, you know, the big catechism of the Catholic Church promulgated by jo uh, John Paul II. And um, I actually read it cover to cover in the nine months of my RCA, uh, RCIA. I read it cover to cover. And I was trying to convince my parents to become Catholic. <laughs> and I, th I thought, you know, it was the greatest thing. I thought, oh, you know, we got the rosary, we got, you know, the saints and all this, you know, this big, pretty cathedral. And then I discovered about a few months in, um, actually it was shortly after I was, um, you know, confirmed or chrismated, they didn't baptize me. They accepted my father's um, heretical Protestant baptism he gave me. <laughs> you know, I love you, dad, if you're watching, but you know, we, we're honest in, in my family. Um, it wasn't a proper baptism. I think I was immersed only once. Uh, not that the Catholics did. There, there was one person out of our adult um, group becoming Catholic there who got baptized and they just treated her like a bag of tea. They poured water over her head and, ooh, she's baptized. And, no, <laughs> go to an Orthodox church. You'll see what a baptism looks like. Um, and, uh, you know, I was, so I was confirmed by the, by the bishop on, uh, you know, by the Catholic bishop on, uh, uh, on Catholic Easter. And so I was, um, really disappointed as I kept studying and realized that the Catholicism I was experiencing was actually not the Catholicism that I was reading about and hearing about with all the, you know, the, the, the really heavy duty, um, old Latin spirituality and very, um, hardcore praxis compared to what they had in the Novus Ordo. And so I started desperately trying to find a traditional Latin mass parish. And I started going to a traditional Latin mass group um, that was in communion with Rome uh, out in, uh, in St. Thomas. But I couldn't go all the time because I couldn't drive and I had to carpool with other, um, you know, TLM fanatics. And uh, I got to the point where you know, I had like the SSPX missile and you know, had my hardcore St. Michael chaplet and rosary and you know, I was doing all these devotionals, but I was still struggling with all my passions. And one thing that they never taught us was, what are the passions? They taught about virtue and vice and sin. And a lot of the time penances were just three, 10 Hail Marys. Once I got told to pray an entire five decades of the rosary once. And um, it was, I was starting to think like, yeah, this is shallow. I mean, even at one point when I was living in my uh, apartment, my dad came over and we were watching uh, YouTube videos of, uh, you know, a certain popular Catholic priest, um, tr a popular traditional one who's uh, claimed to be an exorcist. And uh, we ended up somehow watching some Orthodox videos. 
and my dad was trying to say like, hey, you know, this is actually what I grew up with. And I remembered him telling me about that when we lived in Woodstock and to kind of backtrack a little bit, when I was 18 years old, I did experience orthodoxy when I was still in high school because um, I did a victory lap, um, still trying to figure out what I was even gonna do. And my, my grandmother, uh, Mary Ann, my dad's mom, had maintained her orthodoxy and she passed away and she had a, a an orthodox funeral. I remember seeing for the first time the orthodox priest with the censor, the epitrachelion, wearing, you know, his ryasa and everything. And I thought, whoa, he looks really cool. And I, and I was paying attention to the prayers and they were saying, it was one line from the funeral prayers that stuck in my mind and made me really think about orthodoxy for a bit there. Uh, and, and that was, and forgive her her sins that she committed in this life, voluntary or involuntary. And I thought, I can, when I was 18 years old, you know, committed a lot of sins. <laughs> I thought, wow, that would be nice to have someone praying for my sins to be forgiven. It, you know, it's God who says he can't forgive sins after death. And uh, I remember saying to my dad, you know, why don't we stop going to the lame Protestant church? Because at this point I was already disenfranchised. I said, why don't we stop going to the lame Protestant church? I said, mom, dad, let's just find an Orthodox church to go to. Well, there's none in Woodstock. Well, let's go and see if there's any in London. Uh, that's kind of a far drive. And, you know, I, and I remember sitting with him, uh, the priest, Father Coteau, at, uh, um, you know, at, at my uh, grandmother's um, post-funeral uh, dinner that they held. And, you know, I, I, I remember turning to my mom and saying, hey, you know, being an Orthodox priest seems pretty cool. I think I might want to be an Orthodox priest one day. And my mom looked at me and she goes, nah, -uh, forget about it. That's not going to happen. They believe this and this and this. We don't believe in that. She, of course, got a lot of things wrong. And again, no offense to any Protestants watching this, but a lot of the polemics and the questions you answer, which are kind of uh, cookie cutter. I mean, go Google this. You'll get your answers faster than you will a reply from me in the comments when I'll, while I'm dealing with hundreds, sometimes thousands of um, interactions. So... You know, I, I would say if, if you're going to ask a cookie cutter polemical question or make an accusation about icons being worshipped and treated as idols and other such um, fallacious nonsense uh, or, um, you know, uh, saying things like, oh, well, you know, you believe uh, like the Catholics do with the with the communion, which, yeah, we believe that the bread and the, and the wine truly become the body and blood of Christ. The way we look at it is very different. And, and the, you know, we have a very different view of ecclesiology from the catholics we have a very unique ecclesiology so just a little side note um you know that that's what happened when i was 18 i i had um you know an interest in orthodoxy that got shot down very quick so coming back almost 10 years from that point um when i was a trad catholic i became very discouraged and after just seeing how the, the, the diocese with where I was living was responding to any attempt to bring back traditionalism, I just one day woke up and I said, I've had enough. You know, how can this be the true faith? If this isn't true, then I guess Christianity isn't. And I thought, well, maybe I'll go check the Orthodox. And then like many of you who are inquiring, I thought, oh, but I'm not Greek. I'm not, I'm not you know, Russian. I don't know Russian. I don't know Greek. I don't know Serbian. I don't know Romanian. How can I possibly go to these churches? And a little did I realize that those things are not, not important. And that actually, um, there was an English speaking Orthodox church in town and that the Russian church, uh, that of course I'm still at to this day, um, is bilingual and, uh, the Greek church was bilingual. So I, I fell away, started dating a girl who was, you know, into some not good stuff spiritually surprise. I was really dumb. And I started looking into paganism. And I went down a Nordic Slavic pagan phase for a while. And um, actually, you know, and I maintained it after breaking off things with this girl. She was, um, you know, into some really uncomfortable things. And I thought, you know what? I don't want to be with you. You know, it's only been a few weeks. And I thought, you know, you're going to these concerts where they're spraying people down with pig's blood. I don't think I want to be a part of that. <laughs> I thought, you know what? No, thank you. And so, you know, I just was kind of, again, just striking at it alone. I took myself off of the antidepressants at this point. I said, you know what? I don't need these. I'm going to find the answers and they're not here. 
And uh, I remember I, I just took my antidepressants. I had, I'd only taken one of them. And I went back to the pharmacist and I said, take them. He goes, you're nuts. You're, you're gonna go through terrible withdrawals. And I said, no, I'm not. And I actually, I never did. I never had any painful side effects. I never experienced any of the things they warned me I would. Um, that, that said, that's not medical advice, obviously. This was just what I did. Um, so after a while, I thought, you know what, I'm gonna try online dating. And I had a couple of situations and dates that were really awkward. Some where it was like the person was practically wanting me to get married and move in with her a week from then. And I said, like, heck no. <laughs> and um, just one day I saw this beautiful woman on, uh, on a dating site that I was part of. And I thought, you know what, I really want to talk to her. She, you know, she, she was dressed classy. She wasn't, you know, showing off. She had a really nice, um, you know, write up about herself and very to the point. And I thought, yeah, I, I want to talk to her. So I sent her a really nice message and didn't hear from her for like a week or two. And I thought, oh, I guess uh, that's not going to happen. So I just kind of coasted, you know, played video games with my friends, uh, went to work. And then I ended up having to move back in with my parents actually in that time frame because I, I, my job kept laying me off and I couldn't afford my rent. And, uh, you know, things were getting tough already at that point. And, uh, I, I, you know, my dad said, Hey, why don't, why don't we go see the new, at the time, the new Tom Cruise mission impossible movie. And I said, yeah, sure. Let's go. And so I went with him and my mom and towards the end of the movie, during the, the, the big fight with uh, Henry Cavill, uh, my, my wife, the woman who would be my wife texted me, uh, she messaged me through there and wanted to meet up. Uh, for coffee and I thought oh wow and I just had this really good feeling and um, even my mom for the first time was like yeah I think that's the one for you you know I think that's the one for you and I thought okay so um, I, I went and uh, I met her and uh, right away we both uh, knew we were the right ones for each other I mean I'll, I can tell you I remember that day vividly you know, I went and got my, my hair tidied up, uh, you know, got it cut nicely, trimmed my beard, threw on a purple dress shirt, you know, <laughs> gray jeans, went to meet her in, you know, September, uh, met her at this nice uh, cafe that was called the Symposium, uh, downtown London. It's not around anymore, unfortunately. Beautiful area by Victoria Park. It was just a beautiful day. And I remember seeing my wife for the first time and uh, uh, just being really impressed with her. I still remember what she wore uh, to this day um you know i remember what she ordered what i ordered <laughs> you know it's just one of those things where it really uh i i fell in love pretty quick and i was impressed with who she was and who she still is is, is who she is today is even better um and so we we started dating and and things picked up pretty quick we did move in with each other outside of marriage but we at this point we were both secular we you know, she had been raised Catholic because she was Polish, um, but she didn't understand a single word because it was a Polish Catholic church. And this is where I'm giving a little hint to maybe some of my cradle Orthodox brothers and sisters from Russian churches or Greek churches who are like, ah, don't, don't let the English in. Don't, don't change the language. Don't, don't do bilingual services. Your kids, if they're talking to all their friends in Russian or to each other, in, uh, I mean, in English and, and not in Russian or Greek and, I got bad news for you. Even if they have some interlanguage skills, they're, they're not going to stick around because we're using liturgical Russian, or church Slavonic. We're using liturgical Greek, you know, um, and that's why a lot of the, the parishes that do really well, uh, you know, and have a healthy, vibrant community, they've, they've allowed for English to come in. They've allowed for people to convert to the faith. So my wife and I were, you know, uh, you know, spiritual, not religious. You know, my wife had the crystals and the the Starbucks white girl spirituality. <laughs> and she, she was not a big Starbucks person. She's very um, um, frugal. And, uh, you know, and I was like, oh, yeah, I'm pagan. I was such a LARPer, you know. I was just uh, LARPing my way through that. And uh, just one night uh, we, were, we were sleeping and uh, I had woken up at around three in the morning 
and I looked over because I thought I saw her sitting up. All I could see was just the outline of her shadow. And I was like, you know, Anya, you know, are you okay? No response. Anya, head slightly turns, but no response. And, and I went to reach out for her. My hand went through the specter and it suddenly turned at me and then vanished. I, you know, I was like, oh, well, what was that? I've never had this happen before. I'd never in my life experienced anything like that before. It terrified me. And, you know, of course, she woke up and she said, what, what's going on? What's going on? And, and so I told her and she's like, oh, great. Now you scare me, right? And it happened two more times. It wasn't long after this where, um, you know, we went to visit my aunt and, uh, you know, I, I came back uh, to the job that I was working at the time. I'd done a couple factory jobs that didn't work out at a construction job where I was uh, not dismissed fairly. Um, it, I won't get into it here, but it was there was it, it was bad enough where they agreed to pay me what they would have owed me had I been on for a full couple weeks because they they had mistreated me and uh, you know I, I actually got hurt on the job and wasn't able to make it in the next day and that's one of the things that led to them you know the, dismissing me. There was I also got in trouble because I, I called out. Uh, one of the guys there for his inappropriate behavior towards a, a young uh, girl walking by on the sidewalk and he was my team leader and he basically told um, his boss that he wanted me gone and so that's all i'll say about it it you know i i opened my big fat mouth to you know try and do the right thing and i got fired and i don't regret it one bit um and then you know i was i was actually working at another call center uh, selling women's training on the phone, which is like workplace hazardous chemicals and safety training. And I was selling that on the phone. And uh, I really had a hard time taking the car salesman approach to things. I had a really hard time trying to convince people to buy something that in all reality they can actually do for free through the Ontario government website. And uh, my numbers weren't doing well enough where they fired me right before my last day of probation. And so I went and I, I was training at an MMA gym at the time. And I, you know, and I was really working out a lot and doing martial arts and boxing. And I said, hey, you know, to the guy training me there, I said, you know, this happened. Is there anything I can do? He goes, you know what? We could get you on an amateur card fight. You can make some money and maybe, maybe we could try to push you through and see if you can get somewhere. So I said, yeah, let's do that. And so I started training that day. They had a new guy and they put him on pads with me just for the start of class. And I went to throw a kick and he jumped back. He got a little nervous, he jumped back and lifted up his arms and the top of my foot connected with his elbow and I broke all the small bones on the top of my foot, just like that. Swolled up like a balloon. I was wearing flip flops. It, it literally looked like a, you know, when, when you buy sausage from the butcher and it's wrapped in that string, it, that's what it looked like. And my wife, as soon as she saw it, she went, oh, you're, you're cursed, like what is going on? <laughs> You know, the demonic nightmares and this, like something's going on. And we, you know, she was really stressed out and I was stressed out. Um, and that night we had um, a strange experience where a, a Protestant, we were given a Protestant cross and yeah, I won't go into the details, but something happened with this where it was like, okay, something demonic is in our home and we've made a terrible choice in our spirituality. You know, I just had the cross up there because, it, you know, cultural reasons, you know, came from a Protestant background. It was really irreverent. It was just an empty cross, no depiction of Christ on it. And, um, it, you know, it, there was something demonic going on there. And it, 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 there was times where it would tilt and turn upside down and it shouldn't have been able to do that with where it was hanging. And, you know, I would always try to rationalize and say, oh, it's probably just because of the wall or just because of the nail. And um, my, my wife finally had it. And she goes, okay, all this freaky stuff, we need Jesus. I'm going back to Catholicism and uh, you can do your thing, but I'm not having any more freaky stuff like this happening in my house. Because, you know, it's, she actually bought the house before she met me. And so I said, you know what, I'll support you. You know, I, you know and I started actually sharing with her a lot of stuff that I learned about uh traditional uh, Catholic theology and you know we had a really good talk and, and she looked at me and she goes you should have been a priest and she says but you know I want to marry you so that wouldn't work out she's like it's, it's too bad you can't be a priest I said yeah I know I, I said I, and actually rewinding again 
not long before I met my wife, uh, I had gone to the Catholic church for confession, um, you know, when I was still with the Roman Catholic church and actually the Bishop Emeritus was hearing confessions that afternoon. And I went and I, and I confessed him uh, to him and, you know, just really opened up my heart. And he turns to me and he goes, my son, have you considered the priesthood? And of course, my, my reaction was, well, no, I want to get married one day. I, uh, I have not. And he was telling me, well, if you think about it, you know, I'll meet me after the, the church at least and get in contact with me. And, and you know, I, I'll get you funding and we'll, we'll get you a scholarship and send you to the local seminary because it's a big uh, Roman Catholic seminary here in, in London. Unfortunately, no Orthodox seminaries. Um, and I never did go. I never took him up on that. And uh, so anyways, we, we came back to the Catholic Church and, uh, you know, my wife did. And she said, you know, I want to go to the Catholic bookstore in town. I want to get a Bible. I want to get a rosary. You know, I want to get a cross with a St. Benedict medal in it because, you know, I told her about that. And she says, you know, all the demons and stuff, we got to do something about it. I'm like, okay, we'll, we'll go. So I drive her there. And actually they had some icons up and I saw Christ on the cross and I couldn't look. And I just kept, I couldn't look on, at him. And uh, they actually had a three bar cross there. And my eyes were really drawn to that one in particular. And I, and I kept looking at him and I look away and I feel suddenly this deep shame. And uh, we, we had to go there a second day actually, because she forgot something. And so we went back the next day and the same thing happened. I go in and I look at the crosses and I had to look away. And I looked over and I saw an icon of the mother of God. And as soon as I looked into her eyes, I started to cry. And the shop owner knew me from before and brought me a chair. And I turned to my wife and I said, I've made a terrible mistake. I should have never renounced Christ. Um, I need him. That being said, all of you know, I'm very against ecumenism. These were Byzantine icons and I had an icon of Christ, which I actually still have up in my office. Um, it's actually a larger version of this one right here. And um, I, I remember going home and digging him out. I, I got this icon before I even really knew what it was. I just bought it and didn't even realize it was written in Slavonic and everything. And um, I just felt a deep repentance. Like I should have never have said anything bad about him. I should have never have turned from him. You know, I was deeply troubled in my heart. So we talked to the Catholic priest. I got, re you know, confessed and brought back into the church. And very quickly we got to the point where we we're like, nah, that there's, there's something wrong here. And I met um, a good friend of mine who I, I to this day love dearly. His name, uh, his name was Frank. Uh, he's now baptized uh, or chrismated as Paul. He's going to uh, St. Vlad Seminary, so praying for him, wishing him all the best. Um, but, uh, you know, he started talking to me about orthodoxy again. It's like, yeah, you know, and how he had kind of thought about it, but he was going to an Eastern Catholic church. I thought, you know what, I really want to check it out because basically, you know, he, we were both papist at the time thinking, oh, we got to be with the Pope and, um, you know. And I thought, ah, but, you know, I could get my Eastern spirituality, like this orthodoxy, this, you know, and I started looking into it. I was like, it's so beautiful with the way that they do the services. It's so much more reverent. The theology is actually richer. And I thought, yeah, you know, Aquinas doesn't make sense when you compare him to Palamas. And, you know, I thought, you know, that there's so much here. Like, what's with this thing with, you know, Nepsis and, you know, the Jesus prayer, ceaseless prayer of the heart, noetic prayer. What is this? And um, that, that, that friend actually gave me my first prayer rope, which I gave to my wife. Um, and then later on gave to, uh, to, to my parents, hoping to convert them, which they did. And uh, he gave me, it, it was a different copy. It was a Penguin Classics, but he gave me a copy of Way of the Pilgrim. And uh, this one's actually um, better. It, it doesn't include the edition that uh, it, it's just the Way of the Pilgrim. And uh, this is produced actually by St. Anthony's Greek Orthodox Monastery, founded by Yerinda Ephrem. Um, and uh, it, it's a beautiful, uh, for one, this is a beautiful book, but its context really started to move me. And I was reading about this, this humble little pilgrim from Russia. And I thought, this is beautiful. And I was so swept up in it. And then I realized something as I was reading, I was like, this is not my church. My, my spiritual life 
isn't reflecting anything that I'm reading in here. And I thought to myself, I'm not so sure I want to counterfeit. And we were going to a Ukrainian Catholic church, which, you know, the priest there was a sweet man. My wife definitely experienced some discrimination, um, being Polish. And, uh, it was on the day of the Holodomir where they had all the black flags, so which it, it was a tragedy, but let's be real. Every country in that part of the world that fell under the Soviet yoke suffered. People died. They acted like they were the only ones. And that wasn't what got me. It was how much they talked about Ukraine and everything being about being Ukrainian. And I even had someone say, oh, you're becoming Ukrainian. I said, no, I'm becoming Ukrainian Catholic. I'm like, oh, but your last name's Ukrainian. I thought, okay, we're on the old calendar. We have all this and this. Why do I feel like I'm, I'm wearing a costume when I go to church? And so I started doing a lot of digging around. I, I started talking to Orthodox priest. I, I talked to the Romanian priest in town first and he goes, oh, you know, the papal infallibility is not possible. I'm so sorry. <laughs> he says this to me in his, in his wonderful accent. And, you know, he mentions people like St. Paisios who I hadn't heard of yet. And, um, all these other things. And of course, this this was during the time of the Pachamama Synod. And my wife just finally said, you know, he's not my Pope. Of course, you know, denying the Pope on any level in Roman Catholicism is like, oh, well, you're kind of excommunicating yourself. And and I told her that. And she said, well, I guess we should look elsewhere. And I said, yeah, you know, I, I was tempted at one point to join the CMRIA, which uh, is a Sede Vicantis group here in town, traditional. Uh, but I thought, no. No, I said, uh, I, I want the Eastern. And so I, I kept thinking to myself, like, why did, why does my spiritual life feel so shallow in the Ukrainian Catholic Church? Why why is it that we're venerating St. Gregory Palamas when he's a saint for actually denouncing the very thing we're in union with? You know, he attacked the scholastic position of Barlam. You know, he attacked the filioque, which even though we didn't recite it in our church, we still had to accept it. And I thought, this is, no, you know, and they would tell you, oh, there's ways to make the theology compatible. Yeah, through mental gymnastics, through, through lying to yourself. And I started comparing the theologies and I realized they weren't compatible. And then I started realizing like, well, wait, there's other problems. There's Monophysites in communion with Rome. There's Coptic Catholics. There's Nestorian Catholics. And I thought, but these guys were condemned in the ecumenical councils. How can we appeal to the councils and to tradition when we're having communion with people with Christological errors? You know, you don't see any sign of papal supremacy or infallibility in earlier councils. Lots of the, the all the decrees and decisions of the first seven ecumenical councils, the eight ecumenical councils, however many you number. You know, some people say there's seven, some people say there's eight. I'm on the side of, uh, of the fence where it's like there's eight technically. Um, they they don't reveal anything that reflects papal ecclesiology. And I thought, no, there can only be one truth. And, um, you know, I was still kind of afraid that leaving the Pope would mean that I'm going to hell and my wife and uh, uh, a really sweet um, local priest from the Antioch church uh, gave me a book. It's called Know the Faith by Father Michael Schamber. I got to get in touch with him. So please, if one of his parishioners is watching this, please give, give me his email again. I meant to get in touch with him and I just, uh, you know, life got, got busy. But he, he wrote this book, Know the Faith. It was the only book from Ancient Faith Publishing that I've actually read and thought, you know, good. Except for, I mean, at the time I read and, and listened to Orthodoxy and Heterodoxy by Father Andrew Demick, which... Um, that, that book did help me realize kind of the ridiculous, um, you know, comparisons and, and how ridiculous some of the Catholic and Protestant positions were on an even uh, deeper level where I thought, yeah, it can only be orthodoxy. Like this really highlights the truth for me. Um, and so I, I actually, I, I read port, uh, a certain thing out of the, uh, it was an excerpt from the, an excerpt from the epistles of. St. Ignatius of Antioch that Father Michael had quoted in his book. And that was how he who partakes of the chalice of a schismatic will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. Boom. Realizing that the church was a pentarchy and that only one patriarch fell away from the other four. Reading that 
putting everything together, I, I had that eureka moment. And I, I ran up to my wife. I said, honey, we can't remain Catholic. We have to become Orthodox. And she goes, oh, great. You go and drag me to another different church. I got used to the cathedral with the, with the Novus Ordo. And then, okay, I acquiesce. I didn't like the less traditional. I wanted to go to the TLM. Then you take me to the Ukrainian Catholic Church. Now you're taking me to the Orthodox Church? And she's like, please tell me that we're going to have stability. <laughs> so, you know, I, I tried going to the Greek Church, kind of got turned away. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I was not given good advice. <laughs> um, he told me uh, to go be with my own people. And I said, well, who are my people? He said, go back to the Ukrainian Catholic Church. You know, there's, there's no, you don't need to rush out of there. I thought, whoa. I thought, that's not good. And, you know, checked out some other churches where there wasn't English, like the Romanian. Um, we went to Antioch for a bit, but we, we found that there were still certain things that we caught on to there. Uh, not to not to rail on anyone. It's a beautiful community still, but there were certain things there that concerned us and things that were said that troubled us. And so we th I said, you know what? Come on, let's just go check out the Russian church. You know, I even before I met my wife, I'd read about St. Seraphim Sarov. I was really drawn to him. I heard about St. John of Kronstadt. I started reading about the Russian saints and you know, I read the way of the pilgrim. And I thought, no, the Russian expression really, really captivates me. And so finally, it was, one winter, we were coming back from dinner with some friends and the Russian church was open and we went in there and it was dark, you know, snowing outside and cold. And it was just lit by the candles and the vigil lamps. And I thought, this is so beautiful. And I saw right away, a big icon of St. Seraphim Seraph, St. John of Gronstadt. And I saw, um, Father Vladimir, you know, from, yeah, you, you know, he will be coming back to the channel. I promise he, we've both been pretty busy and he's actually finally having some time with his family. He's finally having some vacation time right now. So glory to God, uh, you know, Ocha, if you're watching this, you know, uh, your blessing, you know, much love from, from me and Matushka. Hope you have a good vacation. Um, but, uh, you know, and I saw him there, I thought, Oh, he, he looks pretty serious. You know, I got the, very light hair, the white beard, the piercing blue eyes, it almost look like the, a lot of people make the joke that the icon of St. John of Cronstadt really looks like him. Similar facial features and expressions. And, um, you know, we, we thought like, oh, okay, you know, she said, you know what, give him a call because I did not understand a word of vigil. <laughs> you know? She said, give him a call and let's just find out. So I called him and he answers the phone pretty quick. He goes, hello. And, uh, so I say, who I am? And he goes, I ask, you know, um, I, I was shocked because he answers in perfect English, no accent. And, uh, I said, uh, you know, do, do you guys have like English services? And he goes, well, we do actually do one English service a month. And, uh, but you know, we're a bilingual parish. Every service is a mix of English and Slavonic. And I thought, uh huh. Okay. Uh, can I come check it out? Yeah. You know, and it was the Ophany. And I go into the church and I'm just blown away. The choir was um, incredible. The, the, the chant was beautiful. And, uh, you know, in this time frame, I became friends with a couple of Greek Orthodox guys who, um, you know, they were really supporting me going to the Russian church. And uh, <laughs> Sotirios in particular, um, my dear friend, who was the spiritual son of Yeranda Ephraim, actually his father, um, knew Yerinda and, and actually was, uh, was his translator uh, many times when he was first coming here, meeting with, uh, with hierarchs and various people. Uh, and, you know, Sotirius really helped me with learning the faith and experiencing the Orthodox life. And, um, you know, he, he also knew Father Vladimir and he said, yeah, he's a good priest and he is <laughs> a great priest. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I thought, wow, this theophany service is just the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. I saw Father Vladimir uh, chasing down the starosta of the church with, uh, with, you know, spraying him down with the holy water. <laughs> it was so joyous. I went home and told my wife, I said, it was beautiful. The choir was amazing. The, you know, the service was so lively. The, the blessing of the theophany. She goes, oh, okay, you know, this sounds great. So, you know, we, we met with him uh, after that, had an amazing talk. Uh, you know, he, he was surprised to see that I'd done quite a bit of homework and had learned a lot and that I, I was very familiar with the liturgy because of my time with the Ukrainians. 
And uh, he said, well, you know, let's just for now, let's just keep talking and we'll just naturally kind of approach catechesis and we'll just see where this goes. So we went for another service and then we came back and, you know, he said, let's, you know, let's meet in a couple of weeks. So we went and we met again and uh, we were talking. And just at one point in the conversation, he goes, who am I to deny water? He says, you know what? Um, I normally don't do this. And, and it's true. He doesn't. I've never seen him do this since then. Um, he said, you know, I'm going to baptize you. Let's, let's make this happen. And so we set up a date in February and uh, which was only just a couple of weeks from then. And he says, you know, and my wife and I were wanting to get married. We still hadn't been married yet at this point. And he said, you know, and we'll, we'll marry you guys. He says, well, so we'll, we'll do your um, baptism on Saturday. We'll baptize you guys and bring you both into the church on Saturday. And then we'll, we'll marry you um, on Monday. You know, so you can have your first communion on Sunday, Monday. And he says, and of course, you got to be to behave at home. You know, you have to be clean and I said okay we can do that <laughs> you know so you know we set the date uh, my baptism was February 8th 2020 uh, you know that's when my wife and I were received into the church and then we were married on February 10th which actually happened to be my mother's birthday of 2020 and um, you know we kept having talks with him and learning from him and then uh, the pandemic happened and uh, we, you know, we didn't do the, the, you know, we didn't give in to the tyranny as many Roquefort parishes didn't. And we still communed people. We still served people. And, uh, you know, it, it was, it was tough. It was really tough going through that. And there'd be times where the restrictions would get lighter and they get worse and get lighter and they get worse for, you know, for, for a few years there especially here in Ontario, was really um, oppressive in Canada. And uh, it definitely had an effect on us, but we fought. We fought really hard for our faith to keep going, and uh, we made it through. And uh, at one point before my, uh, my one-year anniversary with the church, um, it might have been after a year or two. I think it was in 2021, actually, uh, towards um, the end of 2021 in, in the summer. My, we sat down with Father Vladimir, and he said, "You know what?" He said, and th this was after he tried to help me get set up with another business endeavor and tried doing work. And some of the work I tried doing with another friend in real estate fell apart. And uh, I sliced my hand open actually working at uh, one of our parishioners' wineries. And uh, he, you know, he kind of took that as a sign. He says, "You know, let's let's put you in seminary." And so, you know, I had to do the distance program with Jordanville, the CTS. Um, <laughs> unexpectedly, my wife got pregnant uh, during that time. And so that, that definitely impacted my ability to study and get things done. Um, there was a lot of other struggles going on at the time in our home, in our, in our lives in general. And uh, it was really hard to focus. Forgive me. Um, it was hard to focus. And so we, um, you know, we, we ended up uh, thinking like, how are we going to pay for me to have the education? Well, I prayed to St. John of Cronstead and uh, through a generous benefactor who actually I'd, I'd helped out before, just a week before at the church with a problem he was facing. I just opened my, my door to him. I, I tried to help him out as much as I could. He just showed up and gave me exactly the amount of money I needed right on the dot. And he said, you know, I was going to come here and just meet you, uh, to talk to you. And all of a sudden, you know, he says, I, I just felt this urge to give this to you. And he says, I want you to take it and put it towards the glory of God. And so I said, okay. And, um, you know, so it, that happened. And then I was made a, a subdeacon um, before my son was born in 2022. Um so it was end of 2021, beginning of 2022, when I started the CTS program and all this happened. I was made a subdeacon uh, Thanksgiving of 2022, uh, you know, reader, subdeacon, all in one service. And um, then, uh, of, of, sorry, of 2021. And then uh, my, my son was born end of 2021. And my daughter was born end of 2022. So sometimes it's get the, the dates mixed up because they were both born in December 
Um, my son was born December 13th, 2021. My daughter was born December uh, 24th, 2022. Um, new style. Um, so yeah, you know, 2021 came around and, you know, October, you know, that's Canadian Thanksgiving. I got made a reader subdeacon um, on behalf of Archbishop Gabriel by Archbishop Irenae of the Canadian Diocese of the OCA. And, um, you know, I was just going through things and Lent came around and Father Vladimir was saying how he needed more help in the actual altar and saying, you know, I, you know, I thought, well, do you, you know, we, we talked and he was telling me, he was saying like, you know, I think we might need to accelerate things. There's a real need. And, you know, our parish was growing. Um, the demands of the people were, you know, for pastoral care were increasing. And, you know, we baptized a lot of people. Uh, such a glorious time. And uh, he he says to me, you know, I, I need someone. I'm like, are you, are you thinking like the acne goes and maybe deacons are kind of useless. <laughs> He's just joking, of course. Um, and then just last week of, uh, of Lent, uh, you know, moving into Holy Week, I come into the church and he says, it's been approved. I, I said, what? And he goes, you're going to be ordained to the priesthood. And my jaw fell to the floor. I thought, whoa, okay. Um, already. <laughs> he says, yeah, you're going to be ordained to the priesthood. Um, we're, we're looking at doing this uh, around end of May. I said, okay. You know, my, my kid had just popped out not that long ago. And uh, I was, I was uh, excited, but scared. And, uh, you know, so I had to go to Jordanville because Vladika was stranded in the street and in the States at the time. And we were going to plan for him to meet, uh, to meet with him in Jordanville. And, uh, and actually at one point it looked like he wasn't going to be there. Um, and so we were thinking, well, it was just going to be, um, Bishop Luke ordaining me on his behalf. Uh, cause you know, we, we help each other out <laughs> and, uh, just as we were getting ready to go, all of a sudden, uh, you know, Metropolitan Larian, you know, God grant to memory eternal, uh, reposed in the Lord. And uh, his burial got scheduled for the day that my uh, ordination to the priesthood was to happen. And uh, it still happened that way. I was ordained the day we buried him. So I was ordained uh, the Saturday before, helped receive him as a deacon. And then I was ordained in the presence of his relics uh, at, uh, the, in the main cathedral at Holy Trinity, uh, monastery, I was ordained by the hand of my Bishop, Archbishop Gabriel to the priesthood. And, uh, in May 22nd of, uh, 2022. And, uh, it was overwhelming. And so that's, uh, I, I didn't even get a chance to finish my CTS and I got, pretty busy as a priest. And then of course my wife, uh, at this point was actually two months pregnant <laughs> and end of the year we had our, our little Maria. So that's, that, that's how I became Orthodox. Um, I'll be talking about this on another channel at some point. I'll let that be a surprise, which one I've actually got to respond to an email to him tonight. Um, but I wanted to thank you all for tuning in and listening to me talk and uh, taking my time with this. And, uh, you know, glory to God for all things. Uh, everyone's journey into the church is different. Um, you know, I was 31 when I got ordained, uh, just, you know, just a couple weeks after my 30th birthday, uh, 31st birthday. And so uh, canonical age, but, you know, pretty early in my um, Orthodox life, but, uh, you know, glory, glory to God for good teachers, for good mentors, for good spiritual fathers. And, uh, and of course, for the, the beauty, the wonderful hospital that the church is. So thanks for watching, everyone. God bless you, and I'll see you in the next one.